this is okay. okay. So that's when I can choose okay. okay. I should be here. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, presentation, Mike. I couldn't deny it. I wrote it myself. So uh, and also, thank you for inviting me for this uh, presentation. I start to understand that I'm more or less the only operator presenting and speaking about something. Uh, and uh, I'm the object that we, uh, that's inspected, more or less. But uh, I got uh, our philosophy is to be open with the, whatever problem or issues that there is. Uh, I was asked uh, by uh, Hillary that uh, should cover what problems do uh, operators have with uh, the eSIMIT. Yeah, there's a lots of course and lots of issues and discussions. And as you said uh, also, Mike, it's, uh, uh, no. it, it, it's uh, specific for the CTVs. Uh, I, uh, I started in uh, NOS six years ago. I came from a tanker and uh, been working out in the Norwegian, uh, Norwegian uh, sector with shuttle tankers, etc. And uh, I had, uh, of course, issues with the legislation, SOLAS, etc. I uh, thought it was tricky sometimes. But when I came to the CTVs and these grey zones, it was a total grey zone. Uh, it was more or less new regulations, especially new international regulations. There is, of course, national from each, each country, but uh, then I realized this is really something to, to uh, dig deep, deep into and to make changes and to find a standard. Uh, would you just like to, to present the NOS a little bit? So I guess not all of you know us. Uh, the business for the Northern Offshore Services was started in uh, 2008. Uh, we we have actually inherited from 1904, so it, it's a it's a family-owned company which have been in the tankers and, and uh, for for many years before this. It's actually started up. Uh, they, um, they had a company supplying uh, provisions and crew change in, in uh, between Sweden and Denmark, uh, and uh, they had a new building and it was passing from Southampton where it was going up to the to Gothenburg. And then uh, there was called up from uh, from the wind park that was on the construction of the Netherlands coast, and uh, they were asked, Could, "Couldn't you come and test and see see how it works with that vessel? It looks it looks a nice vessel." And they did it, and uh, they did it for a couple of days a week, and uh, then they went up to Gothenburg and went on with what they usually are doing. Uh, they thought they got to be pretty well paid, but after a couple of years, we, we found out that we got the same payment as as the other vessel. Amon Hall was trading there, but um, we did twice as good job with this catamaran. So I, I, I would like to believe that we were a part of the, and one of the pioneers in this business, where we actually have grown up and made a standard out of these catamarans. That's uh, the best way to do this. I don't like to say it, but the bump and jumps, step, step to work, I would prefer to say. Uh, today, NOS have... Um, Offices in, in Sweden, that's our main office, and uh, in Denmark, that's where we run the operation from. And uh, we also established a, uh, an, um, a company in the UK since uh, six months ago. Uh, we also have an um, energy company, uh, actually selling lubricants for the wind farm industry in, in Europe. We're exclusively for ExxonMobil. Uh, and we still have this, as I mentioned, um, this crew change and provisions that we're still providing in, in, the, in the coast of Sweden, especially. Uh, today we have 30 CTVs. There's no one from Siemens here, I, I hope. We will have delivery in, on, on Monday, <laughs> a little bit late. We're a week late, a week late with, with, the, with number 30. Uh, so, but it's, 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 uh, they're doing the last uh, the tests, etc., and will be delivered on Friday and then go to the UK to starting up. Yeah, that's what's short about our company. And also a little bit of our history. We have been in the most areas <coughs> around, around uh, Europe. We've also been in the Irish Sea. Uh, this is what we, we are actually for the moment situated. 
uh, we are um, so we have really learned from 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 the history and in all these and been as a pioneer from from day one in this business i will come back to that side, uh, picture later also so as a former speaker talked about there is for sure a need for regulations and standardization in, in uh, for the ctvs uh, so this is more or less my conclusion and also as we started up today that there is work ongoing in in the uh, imo it, it, it's it, it will be but as it looks what i hear it's uh, 2023 we will have probably some kind of standard standardized regulations for the ctvs until then we will live in a world which is from case to case day to day and uh, it, it's important that everyone understand how Op uh, CTVs are operated and the conditions around that. So that's the part of what I want to inform you about and how we work. Um, we have, since that day one, I, I got the assignment from the owners. We had eight vessels and it was more or less told that we want to build a professional ship management company. I believe we're one of very few in this business globally that actually have a professional ship management. Uh, and we knew it well because m most of us came from tankers and offshore industry, oil and gas before. So, so I, I think we was the right guys to do it. And uh, that, that's what we have been doing from the beginning. Uh, we started up with ISO systems. That was the market was requiring ISO because they thought that was the way to do it. It was not that much uh, knowledge, especially from the energy companies during these days. Uh, and uh, but we established it and, and have, have helped us really much uh, for um, finding the, the good quality level of what we do uh, in our day to day work and how to also for the whole company for establishing routines, etc. Uh, this wasn't, uh, of course, enough. Uh, we also introduced uh, voluntary ISM. As one of the first, we got our PUC in 2011, uh, and that we still hold, of course, for cargo vessels and for passenger vessels these days. So um, we have also participated in, in many groups, especially in Denmark, in the, in the Danish Ship Owners Association, and together with our competitors, we have been discussing uh, what we can develop and, and improve. Uh, in, in general in this business. Uh, as mentioned before, also I'm, I'm a part of the CMID uh, steering committee. Uh, and also we developed in, in Denmark crosswind network, it's called, uh, where, where we're working together with all the other operators. Uh, there is a need for, for new rules. One example is the 24 seat, as we prefer to call it. Uh, on this, the, the, um, our so-called D-class, we can carry 24 IPs, is the more correct, or offshore technicians or whatever. I guess you all know what I mean. Uh, and just to give you a little timeline, that I, I got a requirement from the owners, because they heard from all the customers that uh, they want 24 seats on board the vessels. And more or less, I got um, instruction from the owner, fix it. I said, how the hell <laughs> should I do that? Never mind, fix it. Uh, so what I, was, what I was doing, this was in August 2015. Uh, and in October 2015, we had the Danish Maritime Days. So then I had the opportunity to uh, activate one of my former um, uh, colleagues, and, and, uh, which I've been working a lot with. It's Simon Muckler on the DMVGL. And he attended and we gathered together with Shipyard. And uh, Simon knows most, I think, what to know about uh, Dan uh, Danish, German and UK regulations when it comes to CTVs and uh, this when it comes to the high speed drop code and the combination. So uh, we had a meeting in two hours, I think. And Simon explained for us, this is what you should maybe possible fulfill. And uh, the Shipyard took it to them. and. Just in a month, we had changed the design. We was building these D vessels already. So we changed the design and upgraded it. it one, of the, one of the parts that we did was to move 
one of the bulkheads in the forward part of the vessel to fulfill the high speed craft cargo code. So that wasn't actually in that part of the project, it wasn't that painfully. <coughs> then uh, in uh, something like January 16, we had uh, a new design, a new price. I think it cost us 200,000 euros more to make these ad adjustments to fulfill uh, these uh, requirements. During this uh, process, I, I had a dialogue with the Danish maritime authorities. And um, I was pushing them a lot, and I said, "Here you got a pilot uh, project. You can get it. We we will pay for for the cost for traveling, etc. Just just look at us and see what we do, and make us help us to make a new standard." And uh, they was very positive, as, as as usual, I could say, when working with them for the last six years, and they was really listening to us and respected us. And they, I got more or less a promise from from the director, the highest director, that. We fix it somehow. We fix it. Just go ahead, and that's what we did. Uh, they also promised us that we will hold uh, meetings. We will, we will have making a hazard, but of, I don't know maybe political reasons or what it could be. It wasn't done in the regime of the DMA. Uh, we had to do it ourselves. So while the vessel was built uh, under construction. We, um, we had an um, uh, hazard together with the DMVGL up in Oslo at the, their main office, where we really met. It was a really fight with these, I, I used to call them these days these soulless people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I respect the, 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 as I call it, the blue book, and it's, it's a very good document. It's a lots of experience from, in it, for sure. But when we come to these vessels below 500 gross tons, there is a reason that they are not included. So we had big fights with DME in this office, in the meeting. I actually had, after the half of the meeting, I had to stand up and say, shut up, we are paying for this, do as I say. <laughs> but it worked. Actually, I very much respect the DME. They, they calmed down and we had start to Really, I told them, start challenge us, ask us questions. What, 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 what is the risks? What, 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 what should we do to mitigate these risks? And it's actually after pretty much discussing back and forth for six, eight weeks, it, it finalized with the HACID and also uh, mitigations. There's a big matrix in an Excel document where we compare to a high-speed craft code uh, cargo and the notice B, that's the cargo regulations, the Danish cargo regulations. And um, I, we sent this over to DMA during the summer. Uh, the vessel was due for delivery in July. And we sent it over and they started asking questions back and forth. And we got class into it also, the local office in Denver in New Copenhagen. And um, 22nd of July, we got the vessel delivered, approved for carrying 29 people total on board. So we are pretty proud of what we're doing actually. That we, we, I believe we've done it in a proper way. And we have really looked at the risks and, and found the mitigations and how to, to actually handle, design and handle and operate the vessel like this of this size. So, and in this also, I believe it was around 1st of July, DMA came out with an, um, a circular, a draft circular, uh, which was approved, I think it was in August, by the Danish government, that it was okay. So it, everything was really just on days and weeks, and we, we got, by a bit flexibility from the DMA, we got it approved. And uh, delivered it to the customer in this time also, same as, of course. Uh, and everyone was very happy with that. That's the timeline of it. And number three in this series is being delivered as we speak, as I said. Uh, we have upgraded some parts. I will come to the details here forward in, in the presentation. This is uh, for the HACID. This was, we, we invited the Danish Ship Owners Association and, and DMA and DMGDL and us in NOS. 
And as you see, the, the objective was to identify hazards applicable to the design and operation of the B-class vessels. Uh, the focus on the workshop was on hazard consequence that might be affected by a change in number of PUB. Actually, it's no problem to carry 12. Never. You got all the legislations. We can do everything with 12. The problem occurs when you got 13. It's the 13 patch passenger as actually that was evaluated. What will happen? And uh, our, what we went into this project was that we should have 12 packs and 12 IP and 5 crew. Uh, that's not what, what came out of it. On, on our trade certificate today on these vessels, it says 20 uh, IP and 4 passengers, which is pretty, I think it's logic that you should have it that way. Uh, we have actually a minimum manning document that says that you should have you are, we are allowed to have two crew member if we don't work more than 14 hours a day uh, so so we should actually be able to handle these 24 passengers with this this crew uh, i will come to, to how we solve that also uh, of course fire explosion that's the that's the, the largest risk we have there is uh, incidents and, and accidents in this business, but from my point of view, fire explosion is the, the, that's the main, that's the real big problem we, we get out of that. And, um, and of course, with what ends up with the damage stability. Now we're only talking catamarans, keep that in mind. Uh, all hazards, as we found out, was um, assessed with the. Um, mm -hmm middle risk and one green and no red ones. We could discuss that, of course, always. So the difference between, between the PACs and IP. I don't think I have to argue so much in this group of people about this. But number one, they are educated. They, are, they, are, they, they have a proof that they have a basic safety knowledge. I'm aware of that might not be always the truth from day one with this. Uh, I usually talk, talk about an electrician from Munich never seen the sea before. That is an issue. Of course, there is an issue. But nevertheless, there is a proof that they have ed education. If you compare that to going on a, on a sea container, a ferry or something like that, uh, old gentlemen or ladies or children, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. yes. So these guys, they didn't advance the answer anything else. Like that. Did they want to stick any safety certification on? <coughs> they have a basic safety. They do have that. Awesome. That's what they got. All of them. The Singaporean authority it was uh, thrown a bit of a curveball in saying um, we agree with STCW uh, mm. requirements, so there was a bit of a danger of anybody <laughs> having to be STCW, but then you asked for <coughs> whatever else, and <coughs> there's been a recent uh, uh, round robin, and, and uh, industry bodies have been asked to provide equivalency to STCW, the same GBO, the PTO, body app, all those things that we've already looked at. No, they, they shouldn't be, but it, 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 it is, yeah, but it, it is, as you say, Chris, we had a dialogue with, the, with DMA during this, that it should be in this circle or on this definition on, on the uh, <coughs> offshore technician, the IP, they should be, um, so you benchmark all these different kinds of educations. But it's once again, we have, we have to, as you see, what we do is pushing, because if no one pushing, nothing happens. So we have to go forward with this and, and, uh, and uh, to make something happen. And I believe we have been a part of that together with DMA to actually make a change. So everything is not 100, but we have made a change. Yeah. 
that's the important as, as from my point of view. And I, I, I just, if, if you compare them to a passenger on, on a ferry, I mean, they are medical fit. They got the paper on that. It's documented, issued by a doctor. It's not the so-called blue book, but it's nevertheless. They got their own safety equipment. Uh, these guys, below, if it's uh, below 12 degrees in, in the water, they should even carry their immersion suit. Uh, they got the familiarization on board, which they at least should look at. And there's done by video and the, the next one. They are between 20 and 60 years of age, I believe. That would be in the normal. They're super. I hope. But I mean, that's a big, big difference compared to when you are on a ferry. Because on a ferry, you could say everyone could be drunk and they could be 98 years old or five years old. That's accepted. So, so what, what more or less I start to question is how the hell, excuse me, could they allow passenger vessels and question these vessels? I mean, all of the crew is, and the passengers are educated somehow. Maybe not exactly to the point according to STCW, but that should be on the margin as I see it. They are seated in a, in a limited area. So you've got pretty big control over these guys where they are. Uh, there is two doors, yeah, they could go out on the deck. But still, they are sober when they go out on the deck. They are medical, they are fit. And uh, it's also, I, I, this is an, an, a picture of what, what we are working for the moment. And as we see it, if we got an incident or, or, or something happened to any of our vessels in NOS, we have a philosophy that's a part of this, that it should be maximum six hours to get help. Actually, it's 5.5 hours as according to our trade uh, certification. So what we do when we start up the site, we do an um, emergency response plan and we find out all of the resources that are close to this site you could compare it somehow to uh, operate to permits according to high speed craft code. But this, this is actually, we can more or less save ourselves because we got so many sites in NOS. So we can more or less send one of our, our own vessels if we, if we come in, in some kind of talk. Mm -hmm. And there is intense in the wind farm business when it comes to uh, vessels. There's lots of vessels that could help actually. You can trust on it every day, every minute, every hour, but it limits the risk. It takes down the exposure hours. As I said, we got a minimum manning of two persons. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's on the limit, I could admit that. It, it, it's, it could, could be, but once again, it's, it's the exposure hours. Uh, so far, we haven't had. Yes. Uh, oh, I know. With with two people, two crew on board, basically carrying twenty-four bags. Based on a matter of our situation, are two people enough, in your opinion, to recover the first time to one? To get the facts. But I don't want to forget the packs because there are no packs. No, there are IPs. Forget the packs existing. Yeah. 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 I admit that this, this this is the critical point where you end up in, in all when you're discussing CTVs. It's it's these two persons and is it enough or not? Uh, but but I, I, I don't want to, I won't answer you black and white, but, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's an important issue. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. And we, we manage it, and you also know that we worked a lot with, together with Ian and his people uh, during the years, and, and uh, I think that's the most drilled thing in the, is for the CTVs, it's man of a board. It's, more or less too much of it. It's, it's uh, lots of focus have been been spent on uh, the manual board. Uh, 
So what will we do when we have autonomous vessels? Pardon? How will we manage man on board, the so-called man on board test? When we have one man person? Ah, that's another issue. <laughs> yep. But these are the interesting questions, actually. That, that's where we end up with. So. But just, just to see, look on these exposure hours again, and I think that's an important part of it, because as I, as I uh, written there, it's the IPs are not on board when it's the really worst conditions. The, this is no, not uh, vessels crossing the North Sea or the Atlantic. They are actually hiding in port when it's real bad weather. Okay, there is, there is, a, there is a, a window where you've got the problem. But it, it's so much decreased compared to this passenger vessel again passing the North Sea that has to manage all situa situation by itself. Uh, I know that uh, Tallink, they have taken away their um, lifeboats on their new su super fast ferry. They have no lifeboats. They use it for the, for the passengers in that, that, that area. Because they're trading between uh, Tallinn and Helsinki. And they are not more than six hours away from port. I want us to start thinking another way. That, that's, that's my message to you. It's, and once again, seems like lots of Sula's people in here. <laughs> Sorry for that, but I, I believe that there, there's possible to think uh, in, from other you know, angles instead of staying in this old fashioned thinking from 1953 or whatever it is. I mean, it, it's important that we really look on this in a new way. And I, I could honestly say it also, of course, this is a cost issue if we should have another person on board. And this person, it, it, maybe if I take it all the way, it's only do any good in an emergency, that third person. Of course it can do other things. But when you have a two man uh, and you're operating from the shore back and forth, he won't do much good either than just sitting there waiting for an accident. And, Okay, <laughs> I, I had to mention it. This, this is um, uh, our philosophy then, uh, bringing these IPs into our emergency organization. I mean, I guess all of you have been in an airplane and you have probably many of you have been a part of that company's, the airplane's emergency organization. Because they dedicate you, if you sit on the emergency exit, they say, oh, they instruct you, you get this leaflet, and this is what you should do. I mean, the, this, these are actually not tricky issues to do. And, and we, when it comes to abandoning the vessel, I mean, these IPs, they are in a limited area. We've got pretty good control of them to, to, to get them out to the forward deck and to get them out in the life raft. So what we have done, actually, we've got the red seat. And we have one dedicated IP every time that should assist us in any kind of uh, emergency. He got the radio in front of him and he got the leaflets, what to do. It's very small, I think it's three items. He should count people in and he should communicate, communicate together with the mate and the captain. <laughs> I should also say that we haven't pushed it so far that we have tested to man these vessels so far with two crew members. Uh, because we work in 24-hour contracts, so we have five people on board the vessel. So when it's one, one thing is the theory, and one thing is what we actually do in reality. Uh, and we need time to learn how to operate exactly in details and uh, get procedures for this vessel. We have tested it. We have made a drill two times, together with the DMA, where they've been on board and citing what, what's been, been going on. Of course, it was done in... This wasn't a full scale drill. This was done in port, of course, to not have any harm or so to people. It, it takes us six minutes from, uh, and that's then everyone is off the vessel and are in the life raft. And once again, the philosophy on an aluminium vessel, on a catamaran, 
It's not to stay, it's to run. You also have to respect that thinking. It's not this passion the vessel that should manage. It's, it's, I mean, I guess we all learned in the school that it's better to stay on board, stay close to the, to the vessel. But this is not the case on these vessels. Of course, you should try to extinguish this fire. Of course, that's number one. Or, or do what, what you can do for a couple of minutes. And this is high-speed craft code uh, philosophy, more or less. Then you abandon, and you have to be able to abandon these 29 persons real quick. Because if you have a fire, aluminium melting, and the vessel is actually disappearing under you. Yeah, it's just um, uh, regarding the, the damage stability. We, we have more or less no issues with damage stability as according to high speed craft cargo code on these uh, D vessels. We move this bulkhead and um, then we, we fulfill the requirements with both the maximum angle and uh, and filling and flooded uh, compartments. Uh, these are the existing exemptions on the D class vessels. What we did in Denmark, we started with the cargo regulations and looked up on the HAC car, uh, cargo uh, requirements. Uh, so this is a mix of uh, exemptions from uh, high-speed craft cargo and uh, notice B regulations. It's not much as you see. They've more or less fulfilled its details that's not fulfilled. And the Doppler, it seems like it's being solved also by IMO here that we don't need the Doppler in the future. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Anders, what's the um, water spring for accommodation? Where? That's passenger requirement. So we don't need it. So it's a mix of high speed craft cargo and, and uh, cargo roads. Dangerous goods, another interesting issue. Um, we have had a lot of discussion together with uh, both uh, uh, Siemens, Dong, and also DMA. Uh, we looked on the UK regulations, which are pretty basic. You mainly give full responsibility to the operator and to make risk assessments, etc. Uh, so uh, what we ended up together just a couple of weeks ago with DMA is that there would be not necessary to have a dangerous goods certificate on a Danish vessel if you only handle the equipment that the um, technicians are using during the day. I, 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 there, there will be an RO circular issued soon. Uh, so I guess there will be limits somehow. No, not in this. Not, uh, not only. It's only the, the IP's um, equipment and what they got to use. That's the only to be considered as cargo. The other is, is, is so ship's uh, equipment, etc. It, it, it's once again, it, it's we have a couple of vessels with dangerous goods certificates as according to the IVNTG code. And it requires two beer sets, uh, five extra bottles, uh, two chemical suits. What would you do if you have an explosion uh, or so? Because this is, we, we carry gas. That's what we got our dangerous goods certificate for. What would you, and we carry it on the, on the cargo deck. What would you do? Would you go for a chemical suit? That's, that's certain dead death. <laughs> I mean, I would go for the immersion suit. I mean, the important part of this for the captain is to get the manifest. He has to know at least what he got in the vessel. That's not always the story. Today, I even, even I believe. He got to know, and then he got to take the decision, okay, I'll store it there. Then you have gained a lot, a lot, a lot. So maybe an option is to jettison. Maybe an option is to flooding. But to start to take chemical suits, I mean, we're talking spray bottles, paints, uh, and these gases. So um, I'm, I'm very curious of what will come out from the DMA here in the, in the coming 
I hope my weeks. <coughs> but then they got they will have three levels. So level two is for uh, stores that is uh, used overnight. Then there will be necessary to have a dangerous goods certificate, uh, and that I, I believe is, is another story because then you it can be both one or two or three nights or so. So then you don't have that control over the goods. So that's three nights to see. I don't say it is. I, I just this is not a definite. This is an our dialogue that we have with DMA. Okay. But if you store it overnight, that that's what the discussion. Uh, so uh, if you don't have to have any extra on board, it's only for daily use. Then you start to have certifications, and there will be limits on level one also. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry, you said you have uh, breathing apparatus as well. Pardon? Did you say that you carry, you carry two sets of BA? That, that's if, if you, um, as we got it today, as according to AMI GD code. Right. But uh, there will be probably no requirements. Right. Of course, they will check that you've got um, enough water in the forward part of the vessel, and we will probably have a yellow line that limits you don't not allow to have dangerous cargo after that line. You should have it forward. So, so but. There is not, not, I just wanted to show it that it's, we've got an ongoing dialogue with them and it, it's going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think the point here with uh, inspectors is that you know, there's a lot of uh, change potentially, you know, with this, um, this new regulation. Yeah, that's my point, and I, I will come to it uh, in the end also. But the, my point is that um, much things happening. So, 11 months and we changed the regulations in Denmark. And I believe it's it will be an embryo to a standard in the future. So I don't envy you guys. It couldn't be so easy to to uh, to inspect an uh, CTV because there is different regulations from country to country, place to place, that and uh, there is new regulations coming out. We have, uh, as I said, 30 vessels, and I believe we have 15 different types of minimum manning in the because it's always de developing and changing and. Uh, and that's what was my point in the beginning, that we have to be some kind of flexible and cooperate to, to, to find the solutions. I just want to mention also the 24-hour operation with CTVs, which also gives some challenges. Now we're talking working 14 days in a vessel of 30 meters size. Hello. It got some challenges, whether we all know, of course. That's, a, that's always a challenge. Uh, you have to be able to perform the maintenance. You have fatigue issues because it's bumping. Uh, you've got no noise, of course. And once again, the crew. There are solutions. Um, soft bow will make uh, a change. Uh, you avoid lots of these bumping. Uh, you've got silent periods. Uh, I would suggest between four and six hours, you need silent periods during a working day on a CTV. Uh, because you need to be able to maintain, stop the engines and do things like this. Of course, the design and HS is always possible to lower, to have a, not, not to be on, on the limit on the significant y height. <coughs> to give some hope, there is, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm in several groups and we're working pretty much with that during the last years. Uh, we've got Inca, which is represented here. We've got G9 plus. Is that the correct name? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was just G plus these days. Uh, Crosswind Network, uh, that's a Danish, and we've got Global Wind Organization, NV Institute, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And we also got the Industrial Collaboration Committee, which I was in uh, the first meeting uh, two months ago or so. And uh, that, that's the really good thing. I'm impressed that we actually start to talk to each other in these different groups because there are lots lots of work being done all over Europe these days. And so, so, so there is hope for uh, harmonization. <laughs> so, which regulations do you actually inspect against? I know you've got your document and it's more or less yes or no and comments on that. But uh, there have to be lots of uncertainties for you guys out there when you inspect it. 
and I hear also that there's a lot of manual systems built up underneath to be keeping track of the different regulations in the different countries and and, and that's uh, I'm used to the oil companies and, and the Dokim. There is precise uh, as according to Sula there and there or TMSA or whatever. It, it's very precise instructions what you should fill. I usually say it's it's no problem to run a tank at this days. It's just to fulfill all this uh, VIQ and EPQ and, 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 and the TMSA. But here it's pretty open field. Uh, and we and it gets remarks, makes you guys issue remarks on everything. And uh, it's also started lots of thinking and uh, from my own experience, I've seen it for many years in the tanky business, it was pretty complex and, and uh, pretty time consuming for, the, for, for us in the oper operator part that, uh, to respond to all these remarks. I, could, I talked to our marine superintendents a couple of days and, and they say that it's not a big problem actually, we, we handle it. Uh, gets me, makes me a little bit worried maybe. Maybe it should be raised the, the, the quality on the, on the inspections on um, CTVs. So, uh, you could you could uh, you should ask yourself what is the goal of the inspection? Is it to find many remarks to show that you are you're a really good inspector and you cause lots of work for the operator? Uh, I calculated a bit um, ten years ago when I was ship manager for tankers, and we estimated five hundred euros per remark. I just want to to, uh, to put it out here, and it, it's. It's important on the objectivity and the quality of the remark. That's what I want to tell you guys. And I heard it a lot of times here also today. Uh, to, to give us something real to work on. And I mean, we come, the goal should be to increase quality and safety in general. That should be your goal. Uh, I know that you shouldn't give advice or whatsoever, but if you think once or twice before you use a remark and also, before you leave the vessel, there should be remarks. You should agree with the captain of the marina superintendent before you leave the vessel, because we hate these remarks that comes up when you start thinking at 10 o'clock, oh shit, I forgot that. That's what we say too, I say shit, because that's, what's that? What's the problem? No, I didn't know anything about that, the captain says. Then we got issues. Then it takes me even more hours. Hour so. I know there is stress, uh, there's many reasons to, to maybe leaving a vessel without done the work properly, but once again, we're paying for this. We and the uh, energy companies, we're paying for you to do a proper job. And uh, we want to increase our quality, increase our safety. And you are a part of it, for sure. And I believe I, I have done a lot of inspections from my year and also been a part of many inspections. Um, I believe I can go on board any vessel to, and find lots of remarks. That, that's, that's, the, uh, that's not so hard actually. Uh, but you're also demotivating people when they got 20, 30, 40 remarks, whatever. I've, I've never heard of that in our in the cities. But uh, it, it's demotivating people also. Uh, I just want to bring it up. Because you, I see you as, a, as an important part of motivating our people to, to develop, to be better, and, and uh, so we can make all of this business more safe. That's us, what we believe. That we work side by side with the flag authorities, flood association, and we make them understand our needs because we are the uh, experts on CTVs. <laughs> That's our daily work. We do everything we can to set standard in, in this business and to be a front runner. That's what I had.
Did I start some thinking? Thank you very much, Anders. Um, that brings us to lunchtime. So if I can just say to everybody, go and enjoy some lunch downstairs.